Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Tom LeHue and we're going to be looking at the sin of type twos. Now that's not really fair because twos don't sin. Well, maybe a little bit, but we're going to be looking at type twos and uh, trying to understand what this sin of pride is and uh, why it's so challenging, why it's so vexing to type twos and to those that live with them. Now, I'm going to be looking at my notes as we go through this study, and you can download my notes. I put them as a free resource on my website, tomlehue.com. Just go to the store tab and download the free ebook, Shadows of the Soul. And this will give you the notes about all nine types and the sin of all nine types. And uh, it's free. Just go download it. And then you'll have the notebook in front of you. And I will be looking at these notes while we talk about this. Now, I want to begin by saying, you know, um, on my website, I do offer Enneagram coaching. I have a coaching program called Present to Life, and it, it's designed to help you in whatever stage you're at right now in life to get to the next level. Um, just reach out to me. I'd love to just book a discovery session, and we can, we can talk about your life, your challenges, and what the next steps might look like. Um, okay, so let's jump into the sin of type twos, which we know is pride. And, you know, I, it, it's a challenging concept to talk about pride. When we think of pride, we usually think of it as an arrogance or an egotism of putting yourself first and really thinking highly of yourself and exalting yourself. And, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about that kind of pride, like uh, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, or pride goes before a fall, or the old King James, pride goeth before destruction. And, you know, when, when I'm working with twos, and keep in mind, guys, my wife is a type two. I'm a seven wing six, my wife's a two wing one, and we've been married for over 30 years. And so this is a type that I can speak about with some relative assurance, you know, I've I've been in love with a two for a long time and in relationship with a two. So maybe you're watching this video and, you know, realize as a seven, I'm kind of scatterbrained, but I just got to go with it. I got to go with the way I'm wired. Um, but you may be watching this video with somebody in relationship with a two saying, help, things aren't going right. I seem to offend them all the time. I don't know what I'm doing. They're upset. They're hurt. And I want to relate to them better. Or maybe you're watching this as a type two. You know, with the desire to work on yourself, understand yourself better, and, you know, improve your life. And just realize that I'm with you in this 100% because I've been married to a type 2 for a long time. So I'm looking at it from the perspective of someone in a relationship with a 2. And whenever I'm teaching the Enneagram to somebody and I'm going through the types and I realize this person is a type 2, often what I discover is there is a certain level of resistance in twos. Um, it's not always the case. So you may be watching this saying, not with me, you're wrong. Okay, relax. What I notice is there's a certain resistance in type twos uh, as we start to break through the barriers and, for example, talk about the sins of each type. Um, because this pride that twos have isn't often the obvious definition of pride, like arrogance and egotism and putting myself first and being selfish, you know. That is not what the pride of the two looks like. It is more of like a fear of being exposed, and the Enneagram is very exposing. And that's why when we start to work with twos and talk about the Enneagram, sometimes there's this resistance, like I don't want to say anything else. I don't want to talk about this in front of people. It, it is a pride that says, I'm here to take care of everybody else. I'm not allowed to have needs. I'm not allowed to see myself or others to see me as a normal human being. I have to be the person that is giving the care, giving the help, giving the advice, giving the instruction. And I can't be one of those needy people like everybody else is. Because if I was a needy person like everybody else, then maybe I wouldn't be loved or essential to other people in their lives. And so let's start from the beginning by saying the pride of a two is not the typical pride that we think of that the Bible condemns or that God condemns or that is just so, you know, none of us like that kind of pride of boasting about oneself 
or being arrogant or putting other people down. Like all of us can agree that that pride is gross and it doesn't fit anyone well. It looks bad on everybody. And so when twos learn about the Enneagram or when you learn about the Enneagram and you hear that this, the, the sin of the two is pride, it may be difficult for you to connect that for yourself or for the person you love because twos don't see themselves as people who are proud. In fact, they tend to see themselves as like, what? I'm the biggest servant in the room. Like I'm here willing to do whatever it takes to take care of other people. How could my sin in any way be pride? And pride is just a hard sin for us to see in ourselves. I mean, pride hides itself from you. It's not like when you talk to eights and you say your sin is lust and they go, yeah, that sounds about right. You know, or you tell ones their sin is anger and they go, yeah, uh, yeah, that's, you know, everybody can see it. I hate to admit it, but you're probably right. And when you tell sevens their sin is gluttony, they're like, yeah, I always want something else. I always feel like things could be better. But when you start talking about pride with twos, just notice there's a certain level of resistance and, and trouble sometimes in twos being able to see this in themselves. Now, I have met twos who see, oh yes, I know pride is a big thing for me. Uh, but but often, especially with two-wing ones, the servant, you know, two-wing threes, the hostess. By the way, twos are called the givers, the helpers, the connectors, the befrienders. There's a lot of great terms for twos. Um, but let's, let's talk about this. Okay, let me look at my notes. So there is a um, certain way to think about the Enneagram, and that is think of like, in all three, okay, I don't want to get too technical, but think about the three shame types, twos, threes, and fours, the worth and value feeling types, the shame types, right? Think they're all trying to answer a, a, a similar question. They're all basically struggling with this problem of now that we don't live in the Garden of Eden, how do we know that we have worth and value? How do we know that we matter? I mean, we used to walk with God in the garden and we knew we were connected to God. We knew we were connected to each other. But now all those connections have deteriorated. And how do we know that we matter? And threes, you know, they take a very obvious approach that if you want to know you matter, then become a person of value. If you struggle with value, become a person of value. So you could say they kind of try to overcome the shame by becoming a person of value. Fours, they more willingly like accept, they accept the shame and, you know, acknowledge that, that there is this problem. And, um, uh, and then twos, you might say, resist the shame. And this is true of all the types in whatever group they're in, fear or anger, there's a type that resists, there's a type that overcomes, and then there's a type that accepts the problem. Um, and with, with twos, notice there is a certain level of resistance to, I'm not going to be a person of shame. And really, isn't that what pride is? It's like a resistance of shame. It's like the opposite. Like, no, instead of shame, I'm going to demonstrate pride. Okay, so Enneagram type twos, known as the helpers, the givers, uh, how do they resist this shame? Well, they become empathetic, caring, nurturing, um, with a desire to love others and be loved by others and to be needed by others. And let's first of all just say that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a wonderful thing. Like to be a nice person, to be a kind person, to be a loving person, to be a generous person, to be a caregiver. None of that is bad. All of that is good. And it will attract people to you. Believe me, I'm a seven. I was very much attracted to my wife. I mean, she was basically a nurturer and I'm a seven. I'm, my sin is gluttony. Like, yes, nurture me, take care of me. And that creates a somewhat of a lopsided relationship. Do you see the pride there? Do you see immediately when I say this creates a lopsided relationship where one person is like, you know, extravagant in their attention. One person is extravagant in their affection. One person is love bombing another person. And you can see like the, the, um, the imbalance in that kind of a relationship. And that is the way sometimes people will feel in a relationship with a two is they will start to feel that imbalance. And you as a two might feel that imbalance. Like I'm always giving to them. I'm always taking care of them. I'm always meeting their needs. I'm always focused on them. I'm not sure that the other person is really reciprocating this kind of love and attention and affection and generosity and kindness that I'm giving to them. And this can lead to a real problem in the relationships with twos 
And that is, you know, their core fear. Your core fear is of being unloved, uncared for, unwanted, undesired, not appreciated, and taken for granted. And, you know, this lopsided imbalance can easily lead to those fears within you coming to the surface. And you may at times get this feeling like, I don't think these other people really care. And to make matters worse is here comes the pride. The pride problem is you may not feel like you have the opportunity to really share your needs and your desires uh, openly um, and for fear that if I do share those needs, then that would make me undesirable. That would make me um, like everybody else. And there's that shame, that fear of being like everybody else, a person with needs, a person with shortcomings, a person that needs another person to nurture and look after and take care of you. Um, that could feel like you're over-focused on yourself, you're being selfish, you're being self-centered, which is the anathema, in other words, the curse of it too. Like, I can't ever be selfish or, you know, any of those things. I can't focus on myself or my own needs because I'm here to serve others. I'm here to love others. I'm here to take care of others. And other people will applaud your unhealth. They will allow you and praise you for taking care of them and their needs exclusively to the detriment of yourself, to the detriment of you knowing, loving, and caring for yourself and prioritizing yourself. So the pride is not overestimating your own worth and value. It isn't that, that sort of slimy pride that we think of when we think of pride. It is the pride of not being able to fully express your own needs or even to observe your own needs. Like to even be able to take the time to go in, examine yourself, your own needs, your own wants, cares, and, and then be able to share those. There's this fear of exposure. Like if I was to be a person with needs, then I would be like everybody else. And I can't be like everybody else. I've got to show up in a way that offers help, encouragement, support, guidance, and advice, and all these things to care for another person. And again, let me just say, I know I'm speaking in circles. It's just the way my crazy brain works. I know I'm speaking in circles, but just catch that caring about other people is a wonderful thing. I'm in no way downgrading or dismissing that. It's just how do you feel when those when those people don't reciprocate with gratitude, thankfulness, and love, and when they don't appreciate your your care? Now there may be a part of you that's okay with that, like as long as I can go to bed at night taking care of other people and loving other people and putting other people first, then I know I'm a good mom, I know I'm a good wife, I know I'm a good church person, I know I'm a good employee, I know I'm a good manager because I put everybody else's needs first. But often what happens is there's a big part of you that is very hurt and there's a lot of pain when other people don't seem to care enough to take your needs uh, seriously. And so twos often paint themselves into a corner because it's hard for them to express their needs. It's hard for you, if you're a two, to express your needs to others. But here's the, here's the joke. You're not a superhuman. You are a human and like all humans, you have needs and you have um, problems in your life where you need other people's care. You can't always be the person in the one-up position. You have to... I know you would probably see yourself as always the person in the one-down position serving and taking care of everybody else. But you can't always be the person with the resources that's here to take care of everybody else. Sometimes you have to be the person and acknowledge that you're the person with no resources and you are the person in need of care and support and love and attention and nurturing and all those things. So the arrogance of a two, the, I'm sorry, the pride of a two is not about arrogance uh, or egotism. It is the kind of pride that masks vulnerability uh, of your own needs with others. Like I can't be a regular person with needs like everybody else. I've got to be strong. I've got to be capable. I've got to be able to, you know, finish the fight. I've got to be able to take care of all of these people in my life who would be lost without me. So type twos have a deep-seated belief that they must give to others and be selfless 
which again is no problem. That's a wonderful thing. Share that beautiful message with the rest of us. But here's the problem. The rest of the sentence is the problem. Okay, hear the sentence. That they must give to others and be selfless to be loved and valued. And that that is a very sad thought that you feel like you have to give yourself and your service and your kindness and your attention away in order to be loved. And since that is such a great fear of not being loved or not being valued, then everything within you is motivated toward this cause. They feel they must always be the caretaker who supports and nurtures others often to the neglect of your own needs. And you know, you can see what's gonna happen here is since you're a regular person like everybody else and not a superhuman who has legitimate needs, when your needs are not given the priority they deserve, what is going to happen 100% of the time, it's 100% predictable, you're going to feel some level of resentment. You're gonna feel some level of resentment. I give and I give and I help and I help and this is the thanks I get. No one is there for me. No one asks me how I'm doing. No one really cares about me. And also just this sense that realizing that the other people in your, in your life are probably not twos and they don't necessarily pick up on your needs as well as you do. Realize you have like this radar system that picks up other people's needs. Well, the rest of us don't really have that radar system. We have our own radar systems and we might, we might pick up on your needs. But we might think things like, well, if you have something that you need, then you need to speak up for yourself. I'm not going to help that immaturity of not being able to ask for something. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to step in and take over. It's not my place. They might think like that. It's not my place to step in without you asking for help. But the way you're wired is why should I have to ask for help? If you see that I need help, like if I'm carrying in all these groceries from the car and you see me struggling under the weight of all this, then why would you not instantly think I should step up and help? See, you don't really care. And see, you're thinking like a two. But realize you may be looking at a husband or a wife who's a five or an eight or some other type or a nine, and you might be getting frustrated with them. They might be seeing you and not thinking, well, it's not my place to help, or, um, or, or it looks like you've got this, or it looks like you're mad and you don't want my help. Or if you need help, then you need to ask for help. Stop being a child and ask for what you want. I'm not gonna help you in your self-destruction. I'm not gonna assist that. I'm not gonna assist that weakness. That's the way other people might interact with you. And of course, my guess is, is you're gonna interpret this as see, they don't really care. And notice that's your fear. That's a fear that lives in you. They don't really care. They don't really love me. They're not really prioritizing me as the essential person in their life that I know that I am or that I would like to believe that I am. And this is one way in which I think the pride starts to show up in a two is when you have a two that's upset with you, when you have a two that's angry or hurt or disappointed or frustrated with you, you might rewind what just happened in the last couple of days and ask yourself, how have I inadvertently communicated to this two that they're not the priority in my life that they believe they deserve to be? In other words, I've taken them for granted in some way. Maybe I went ahead and made a decision without asking their input. Maybe I went ahead and changed the channel and turned on a show without asking them what they would like to watch. Maybe I went ahead and ordered food without considering that they, what their dinner plans were. What did I do that communicated to this too that they're not the priority in my life that they believe they deserve to be? And think, when you think about being a priority in somebody's life, that's one way to think about pride is I should be first in your decision making. You should care about me and what I want and what I think, and I shouldn't have to say it. I shouldn't have to come out and be direct about this. You should just know if you cared, you would know. And so this ends up this cycle of conflict in relationships with twos, sometimes that can happen. And sometimes, you know, there can be this intense seduction and this intense 
you know, uh, connection that twos want and create. And then there can be these periods of isolation and silence or these periods of frustration or sometimes called aggression. And so there can be these cycles of seduction and aggression that can happen in relationships with twos. And the person with you might think, what is going on? Like, I don't understand. What did I do? How did I cause this person to feel this way? By simply ordering dinner or by simply, you know, ordering a t-shirt or simply buying a, um, you know, an item. How did I, how did I communicate to them that they're not the priority in my life that they think they deserve to be? I don't understand. And this can create all kinds of problems uh, in a relationship and actually bring about the very destruction of the thing the two wants most, which is a closeness and a connection. Uh, this, this, you know, pattern can destroy and create a separation. So neglecting their own needs. This can lead to form okay, this can lead to a form of pride where type twos believe that they know what others need better than those people know for themselves. Think like the doctor or the nurse who knows what the patient needs. The patient thinks they need ice cream. The patient thinks they need television. The patient thinks they need to lay in bed, but the nurse knows better. The nurse knows what medications they need, they know what therapies they need. And so this can lead to twos giving what is often thought of as unsolicited help, stepping over boundaries, and it's going to be called manipulation by other people. They're going to see this help as unwanted, as meddling, as, you know, uh, ingratiating themselves, and people might resist that and feel like they're being manipulated, and then you're going to be horrified when somebody says, will you stop meddling? Will you stop manipulating? We don't want your casserole. We don't want your advice. We don't want your help. And then as a two, you'll probably just shut down and be like, well, fine. If I'm not wanted here, if I'm not needed here, if my help, the superpower I give away, if my help is not wanted, then I'm done. I'm out. I quit. I will no longer sign up. I will no longer help. I will no longer reach out to these people. And then there's this great chasm or this great division and then the people around you come back and apologize or we're sorry and it creates a whole drama thing, right? So wants to be seen as indispensable in relationships and that is one way to think about pride. It's not the pride of I'm better than you, you're here to serve me, I'm the king, uh, I'm the queen. It's not that kind of pride. It's the pride of I should be indispensable in your life. And obviously I'm not. You know, the, the doing phrase for every type, look uh, after all that I've done for you. This is the thanks I get. That's the type two. Type one is something should have been done about this a long time ago. Type three is look at what I'm doing. Type four is look what they've done to me. And type two is after all I've done for you. And you can see in that, that hurt, that frustration, maybe not being able to feel like you could voice what you need the other person to do because you can't focus on yourself. You can't focus on your own needs. And yet you're hurting. You you are hurting, but you're not necessarily communicating. And you may say, well, that's not true, Dr. Tom. I tell my husband, I tell my wife all the time what I need and they don't listen. They don't care. Well, that may be true. Chances are they do care. Let, let me tell you my experience is when I talk to that husband or I talk to that wife and I say, do you love your husband? They'll be like, yes, 100%, of course I do. And the two will sit there and think, mm, 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 mm. Because in their mind, if you cared, you would do these things. And it may be hard for you as a two because you think that way. If you care, you show up and serve. If you care, you show up and you, you encourage. If you care, you show up and you meet needs. But realize, there's eight other types out there and, and some of those eight other types don't necessarily think that way. And so they're going to get frustrated when you keep insinuating that they don't really care because in their mind, they 100% care. They've told you that they care. They've told you that they love you. And yet, you know, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult for you to connect because you tend to isolate yourself in these periods of frustration away from the very thing that you want. In other words, you, you could kind of go dark as a hurt too, who doesn't feel loved and cared for and supported and like your needs are a priority to the other person. You might go dark and then resist the other, your partner when they reach out to you or try to, you know, 
do something with you or to acknowledge you or they make a bid, you know, um, you might resist that think, well, you don't really care. You don't really care. You don't really care. And they're, they're, in their mind, they're obviously trying to display their care, but it's being rejected because you're hurt, because you don't feel connected to them. And they could then give, very well give up and be like, I'm done. I'm done even trying. I'm done trying to connect with you. So just think of it like this, you know, think like what a three could offer to you. You know, you have this wing three, think like a three a little bit more and ask yourself, okay, if I'm wanting connection and I'm wanting, you know, this, this uh, relationship to improve, is the strategy I'm using right now an effective strategy in order to accomplish this, this goal of connection? And what you may realize is the strategy you're using of isolating yourself, withdrawing, I hate the words pouting and sulking, you know, licking your wounds. Is that a good strategy in order to get what you really want? Think about what you really want, which is probably connection, which is probably closeness, which is probably intimacy, which is probably like understanding. Uh, think about what you want and then think, what is the best strategy to accomplish that right now with my, with my partner? And what you may realize is the strategy you're using is not, is not very well thought out. It's kind of like a reaction. It's an impulse. And it's understandable, but it's just a bad strategy. So if I really wanted connection with my spouse, what would I do? And, and then think that way, okay? Or you could ask yourself the one wing, you know, ask the one question, is what I'm doing right? Is it the right thing? I feel hurt. I feel not cared for. I feel devalued. Remember, you are a value type. There's a reason why you feel devalued or not valued. You're a value type. Okay, let's not be surprised. Let's not be shocked. You're in the worth and value group. I don't feel like I'm real, like I really matter to this other person. And watch this, you're gonna blame the other person and move away from the very thing that you want, which is connection with that person. Remember that this problem lives in you. You are the worth and value type. And when you don't feel valued by the people around you, are they really causing that feeling or are they just giving opportunity for that fear and that feeling to come to the surface? Wow, this is mind blowing stuff, isn't it? It's really good. I, I know I don't have it 100% right. I, no one could. No one could have it 100% right, but I'm getting chills just thinking about how good this information is. And I hope it's helpful. I hope it challenges the way you think. And if you're in a relationship with a two, maybe you have a child that's a two or, or a parent that's a two, um, to help you understand, you know, interacting with, and also if you are a two, how your own impulses and compulsions can be keeping you away from the very thing that you want in life. It's not about arrogance, but it's about being essential to other people. And what are you going to see? If you, if you look, you open your eyes, you're going to see, oh, see, I'm not essential. I'm not essential. I'm not essential. They're making decisions without me. They're going to the store without me. They're deciding things without me. I'm not really important. They don't really care about my feelings or my, and just look at what this is going to create in you. I mean, it's a hundred percent predictable. If you're thinking this way, it's going to create this level of resentment within you. And guys, resentment is the real killer in marriages resentment is the real killer in marriages. It's like a stored up pain, a stored up frustration, a stored up anger, and all of this is getting stored up. And uh, remember this Bible verse, love keeps no records of wrongs. So if you're truly loving, like if you really are the person on the Enneagram that understands love, what does the Bible say? Love never fails. Love always endures. Love always perseveres. Love keeps no records of wrongs. But ask yourself, do you keep a record of wrong? Wrongs against you? Um, so a fear of appearing needy or like everybody else. Look, the worth and value types all distinguish themselves away from the rest of us. Threes, they move away from the rest of us by becoming exceptional, uh, you know, in a traditional sense of like overperforming. Fours, they move away from the rest of us by becoming exceptional in like being different than the rest of us, outstanding in some way. And twos move away from the rest of us by becoming essential to the rest of us. I'm not one of those regular people that has all these needs. I'm a person that meets needs. 
are you interested in a relationship with me? But what you'll find out is this person has needs just like everybody else because they were a human being with needs. It's not a bad thing for you to have needs. And notice that certain level of shame that you have even thinking about this. Being a person with needs can create a sense of shame or embarrassment. You might feel more comfortable with the word embarrassment. Like I feel embarrassed having needs or being a person in need but it's really shame. If they were to ask for help, others may see them as no longer being the caregiver or the meter of my needs, and therefore they might lose the attention, affection, and relationship with other people. In other words, why would people want me? And here's where it gets to the sadness. Oh, the sadness. Mm, what a sad thought. Why would people ever want me for me? They wouldn't. And see, there's the shame. See, notice the three. Why would people ever want me unless I was this over-accomplishing person? They wouldn't. Why would people, fours, why would anybody ever want me unless I was somehow standing out, being unique and special in some way? They wouldn't. And see, there's a certain sadness with all of the shame types is there's this sort of giving up on the self. Like nobody would want me for me. They'll only want me if I can take care of them, support them, flatter them, and meet their needs constantly. Well, this is going to exhaust you and going to create an imbalance in the relationship. And you know what? This is often the way it is with twos. Ask yourself this question. How many friends do I really have? Real friends who are peers. Not how many project friends am I taking care of, but how many real friends that are equals, that I see as being equals. How many real friends do I have? You say, oh gosh, Tom, you're wrong. I have lots of friends. Great! Fantastic! I'm so happy for you. But what I find often is the case is the friendliest person on the Enneagram, type twos, sometimes are the most friendless. You have a lot of project friends, a lot of people that you're helping, a lot of people you're taking care of, a lot of people that you're ministering to, that you're serving, a lot of people that you're supporting. But who's really there to take care of you? Who's really there? Have you opened yourself up to let other people in behind the curtain to know you, to love you, take care of you. And let me just ask you this. Do you know you, love you, and take care of you? <sighs> Guys, this is the work we do. The Enneagram is so helpful because it gets through behind the curtain. It gets underneath. It gets in. It gets to talk into the soul. Oh, chills, guys. I'm getting chills. I almost get tears in my eyes because I love you guys. I care about you. I don't want you to suffer. Look, I'm a seven. I want you to be happy. I want you to live the best life that is possible. I want you to be happy. I want you to be inspired. I want you to be fulfilled. I want your relationships to be amazing. I don't want you to suffer. At the core of it, I hate suffering. I don't want you to suffer. And I don't want you to suffer needlessly. And just realize, like, part of this is you recognizing your impulses and compulsions as a two are not bad, but they don't always work in your best interest. And catching the difference is maturity. Learning to push back on these impulses and say, oh my gosh, I'm such a two right now. Doing two things, feeling two stuff. I'm a two feeling the things twos feel. My biggest problem is I'm a two feeling the things twos feel. And if I could catch that and let it go a little bit, I might be able to return back to my relationships and return back to work, return back to church, return back to my community. I might be able to go back to my marriage and be able to have the very thing I want the most, which is love, connection, support, encouragement, and harmony and unity and peace and all these beautiful things. Mm. This pride can prevent twos from acknowledging their own needs and desires as they fear that acknowledging these needs within themselves might make them appear needy or unworthy of love, and so they might struggle to ask for help, fearing it would make them less lovable and lead to rejection. Others would know what I need if they really cared after all I've done for them. And notice, that's it's hard to have a relationship with somebody like that, who's like frustrated, hurt, upset, who has a list of infractions against them, who doesn't think you care about them, and you're always having to prove that you care. For growth and balance, twos benefit from recognizing and honoring their own needs. I am a human being. Say it with me. I am a human being. 
I am a human being. Say that with me. I am a human being. And understand that being, I'm not a superhero. Vulnerable and asking for help when needed is really a strength. It's you pushing back on that fear of exposure. It's saying, you know what? People love me and people care about me and they don't always show it in the way I would like it or to the level in which I show it to them, but that's okay. They're doing the best they can. They're trying to love me. They're trying to show their love and care for me and I need to accept that. I need to accept that. This involves working through their fears of not being loved for who they are, uh, but rather only for what they do for others, learning to practice self-care, helping uh, set good boundaries. If you're a two, you struggle with boundaries. The end period, don't argue with me. I'll fight you, eat a ham sandwich and fight you again about this. If you're a two, you struggle with boundaries. Read the book, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker. It will punch you in the face. Read the book, Boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. It'll punch you in the face. Just, just study what boundaries are and you will probably realize, oh crap, I have a problem with boundaries. A lot of us do. Type twos can cultivate a more authentic sense of self-worth that does not solely depend on how they take care of others, but just I'm loved for who I am. Realize this, God doesn't need you. I don't need you. Nobody needs you. But we want you. God wants you. Your family wants you. People in your life want you. For you. And this may be a hard thing to get your mind around, to truly believe you may be like, yeah, no, no, I don't really know, no, no. Um, but healing the sin of pride uh, allows type twos to form more genuine and reciprocal, let's say even relationships, not always this, but even peer, mutually supportive relationships where they can freely give and receive love, what you really want, Recognizing that they are worthy of love simply for being yourself. Look at you. You're beautiful. Look at you. You're handsome. Look at you. You are you have so many wonderful things. And you know what? When you can relax this need, when you can push back a little bit and recognize I am loved, and I am awesome, and I am an awesome person, when you, when you can get to know yourself, that line to four, right? When you can get to know yourself a little bit, you're, you can relax this fear of being unloved. You're then free to show the rest of us what love really looks like. You're then free. You came into this world with a great capacity to love other people. Go do that. Show the rest of us what real love is. Show us all. But you know, an unhealthy too is just sitting in the corner frustrated that they're not being loved properly. A healthy too is going out into the world showing the rest of us the value of love and what love really looks like at your best. Let's talk about that two line to four and then we're done, okay? Twos integrate to four. So at your best, you look a little bit like a four in some ways. Uh, they need more self-awareness and more authenticity, not just adapting to meet the needs of others, accepting the full range of emotions without feeling ashamed of them, without feeling like if I feel this way, people won't like me or wanna be around me, I'll be ineligible for love creative expressions in their relationships and seeking depth in their relationships and showing their true selves in the relationship, not masking it with this overly helpful, sweet Nancy who's taking care of everybody. And then under stress, twos look a little bit like an eight. They shift uh, from taking care of others to an aggression, like putting my own needs first, prioritizing my own needs. Nobody's looking at, nobody's taking care of me. Nobody, nobody, if they, they see me coming in with the car, all the groceries and nobody helps me. See, they don't really care. So it's like this aggression, this frustration. They're not putting my needs first. Why do I keep helping them when they don't reciprocate? Defending, demanding, domineering, controlling things, demanding others accept your help expressing anger and protecting their own interests. And I just, people might know, okay, you're under a little bit of stress. You want to talk about it? You want to talk about it? All right. What a fantastic study. And let me just say, guys, I'm so, I'm so proud of you for, for doing this kind of work, for making it to the end of a video like this. It's very painful. It's not easy. And I'm very proud of you for, for being willing to go beneath the surface. Okay. Well, Thank you guys. I appreciate you as always. Be present to life. And twos, 
You're fantastic people. I mean, it's awesome. All right, I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye.